Well, hey guys, thanks so much for committing to lead a breakout session at our 2019 men's conference. Well, you guys are the MVPs. Hey, I just want to take a few minutes and share with you a few tips and things that I've learned along the way about leading conversation and facilitating small groups like you're going to be doing. You know, uh, one of the things that I've learned is that oftentimes more information can lead to less clarity. You know, this year we're doing something a little bit different. Brother Doug has asked that for our breakout sessions, we don't give more information. We don't give new content, but rather let's give these guys a chance to process and talk about the information they've already received. You know, sometimes more information leads to less action. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians 4, 8 and 9. He said, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You know, there's a quote by a guy named Juan Carlos Ortiz and he said, the average Christian is educated at least three years beyond their level of obedience. In other words, we know a lot, but do we practice what we know? And so, these guys are going to hear some big ideas in the main sessions. And so our goal in these breakout sessions is really to help them process two things. What is God saying to me personally? And what am I going to do about it? And so, guys, uh, I just want to give you a, some tips that, that might help us increase the possibilities of application and, and will life transformation. That's what we pray that God will do this this weekend in our lives. Um, let me start here. For a lot of these men, it's a stretch for them just to walk into this breakout session. I mean, it's way out of their comfort zone. And so let me encourage you, you're going to really set the tone for this meeting as soon as they walk in the door by your countenance and how you greet them and receive them. And so I would encourage you to be standing up at the door, shaking hands and smiling and high-fiving and making small talk as you can, finding common ground, maybe based on a John Deere ball cap or something that you see. Really try to meet these guys right where they are and meet them in love. And so this is the, this is the idea of empathy, putting yourself in their shoes. Henry Ford said this, if there is any great secret to success in life, it lies in the ability to put yourself in the other person's place and to see things from his point of view. And so I, I want you to realize that these guys are going to be, uh, well, they're going to be way out of their comfort zone when they walk in that room. And so you want to try to be empath empath have empathy for them and uh, emp empathetic, is that the word I'm looking for? Steve Gladden said this. He's a small group leader uh, who writes a lot about leading small groups. And he says, if a leader doesn't develop the capacity to step inside the skin of each group member and see through their eyes, the group will suffer surely. It's guaranteed. Why? Because empathy is essential to creating a safe place. Empathy opens a person's spirit. Empathy cultivates grace. So guys, um, your, your goal with these meetings is not to dispense information. And for some of you, like me, that'll be hard. Because you, you know things, you want to share them. But guys, that is not the goal here. Our goal is not to dispense information. That has been done by Brother Tears in the main sessions. Our goal is to facilitate discussion. And so leaders will have to avoid dominating the discussion. Now, for some of you guys, that, that'll be hard. For some of you, it'll be easy because of your personality. Leaders must be ready, though, to speak up and guide the discussion. So let me kind of give you some tips for that. When men make comments in the group, they're typically going to be in one of three categories. Those comments are either going to build on what's already been said, 
with what's being discussed, or they're going to compete with what has been said, or maybe they're going to be unrelated to what's being said. And so your job is to try to kind of discern, is this comment building on what's been said, or is it competing with, or is it completely unrelated, just out in left field? And so we'll need you to maybe guide the conversation if the comment is competing or unrelated. If it's building on, well, that's what you want. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about how to handle those in just a moment, but the most important thing that you can know as a, as a facilitator is how to listen. Let me talk to you a little bit about listening skills. You know, James said, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And guys, you are going to model for the rest of the group how to listen to each other. This is so important because everybody in the group is going to listen the same way you're listening. And I know this is a scary word, but intimacy is what you're after in these groups. And intimacy will flow from communication, and communication will be a function of your ability to listen well. And by the way, this will apply in your marriage too, just as a side note. But guys, as you're listening, I want you to cultivate the ability to listen to two at the same time. Here's what I mean. Listen to the group member that's speaking, and listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to this quote by Bill Donahue and Russ Robinson in their book, Walking the Small Group Tightrope. Leaders are often better talkers than listeners. We guide, direct, teach, motivate, challenge, and exhort. But less often do we listen. If we will listen properly, we can seize divine opportunities by realizing that the Holy Spirit is at work and trying to grab the agenda. And I hope that you'll all be open to the Holy Spirit grabbing the agenda. And guys, listen with more than just your ears. Listen with your eyes. Don't be looking down at the next question you're going to ask. Look at the person who's talking. Listen with your body. Have your body open and turn toward the person speaking. Listen with your face. Listen with your brain. Process what this man is saying. Listen with your heart. Again, goes back to empathy and compassion. And listen without your lips. And this is so important. Don't add to or embellish what someone else has tried to share with what you think they mean. Or adding your own examples. And Listen for changes in the mood of the group. Sudden changes from happy to quiet or reflective can mean that a divine window of opportunity has just opened up. The Holy Spirit's at work. Body language and facial expressions, tone of voice will give you some ideas if the Holy Spirit's working in a man's heart. The other thing that I want to talk to you about for just a minute is questioning questioning. Now, uh, most of the hard work is done for you in this because the questions are are provided right in your workbook. But I want you to notice, because this will help you in the future as you facilitate, these questions are worded as open-ended questions. You know, a closed question is a question that can be answered with one word, typically yes or no. But an open question is answered with a sentence or maybe a paragraph. The other thing about these questions is they're personal questions. They're not conjecture questions. And here's what I mean by that. A conjecture question is a a question that um, is, what is your opinion on why somebody did something? For, For example, it's an opinion or a conclusion formed on the basis of incomplete information. So if I said, What do you think Jesus meant when he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, 
you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. See, that's, that's an open question, but it's not personal. It's conjecture. What's your opinion? What do you think Peter was thinking when he walked on water? That's not personal. We're not here to talk about what was Peter thinking. And so these questions, I just want you to notice, are worded in such a way that they're both open and personal. Let me give you an example right out of the book. How have you seen God display his power in the midst of trouble? That's not a one-word answer question. That's a question about you personally. How have you seen God display his power in the midst of trouble? And so you want to, you'll want to, uh, in, in your life as a facilitator in the future, you'll want to really begin to use open-ended, personal type questions. Now, I don't want you guys to feel limited to the questions in the book. And so as the Spirit leads, you might give some other types of questions. Let me give you a few examples. You might give a summarizing question. And here's, here's when this comes in handy. Guys, we're counting on you to make sure truth lands. And you may have a guy who says, you know, I think it's important to live with a gal before you marry her because you want to make sure that it's going to work so it can go the distance. Okay, well, he's just giving his opinion, but we got to make sure truth lands right there. And so you might use a, a summarizing question at the end of the whole conversation to say, guys, have you heard how complex these situations can be? But let's go to the Word of God and kind of see what is the timeless principle that we can we can put on the table that that would that would really help us discern God's best for us in all, in this situation. And so you want to have some kind of summarizing question, like what is the timeless principle of God's word that we could apply to this? And you'll probably have some mature believers that'll help you put truth on the table. You might have a follow-up question. Follow-up questions let the sharer know that he or she was heard, can clarify what has been said, and can invite others to interact with what has been said. For example, Sam... When you say God doesn't need our money, are you saying that believers should not give tithes and offerings or something different? There's a follow-up question to maybe bring some clarity or to invite others into the conversation. And then don't be afraid to, to um, direct questions to the whole group. Don't be afraid to ask specific questions to a specific person. If you know that person in the room and you think they would be fine with it. For example, Al, you're an empty nester. How did you and Martha handle that transition? So there's a question directed right at a, at a person. Or you might even relay a question. You might refer back to another, you might refer uh, back to another person or back to the group. For example, would somebody like to comment on Jack's question? Or would somebody like to piggyback on what Joe just shared? So these are these are uh, relay type questions. Guys, let me just summarize everything I've shared with you right here. Keys to questioning well. Don't do all the talking. Remember, you are facilitating life transformation. You are not dispensing information. Don't answer your own questions. The whole purpose of asking these questions is to get these guys talking, which means you're going to have to be comfortable with silence. It's awkward, isn't it? Silence. But guys, don't be afraid to put that question out there and let it hang. Because in the silence, the Holy Spirit's at work. And there'll be a man under the leadership of the Spirit who will speak up. Try to get everybody involved. And I know with a group more than eight people, it's really hard to do that. But remember, the goal is not to get through all the material. If you don't get through every question on the page, that's okay. 
The goal is transformation. The goal is, is discussion and conversation. And be prepared. Read over these questions in the booklet before you walk in there. Guys, I'm so excited about what God's doing in our midst here as we talk about subfloor. Building on a firm foundation. Thank you, thank you for making this investment and leading these two small groups at our conference. If you have any questions, holler at me or Brother Doug. We'll be glad to help you. God bless.